So I, uh, as, as Bill said, I, I work in the bridge design. Um, we, we do design load rating. We, we do some construction support. We do uh, bridge maintenance support. Um, just kind of whatever, as my boss says, other duties as assigned, you know. And so whatever, whatever the needs be, we have a great group of people to handle that. And so I have about uh, 20 engineers uh, in my group that, that work for me. And, and uh, in that group, there's, there's uh, probably four or five EITs that are, you know, a year or two out of school. And, and uh, so one of the things that I, I do with them is uh, we, we sit down every two weeks and we have this hour, two hour long session of, hey, what are you working on? What kinds of things or what challenges are you facing? What experiences are you having? And, and so we'll talk through a lot of that stuff and it might be um, project related items. It might be, uh, you know, um, just uh, professional related kinds of issues of, you know, they don't like where the coffee pot is or whatever the issue is at the moment. And, and one of the things that I always try to tell them, uh, and, and they're probably sick of hearing it now, but, but I try and say it routinely, is that uh, I, the most important quality uh, in an engineer, I've, I've decided what, for me, the one quality I look for the most in an engineer, and, and I tell them it's, it's humility. And, and the reason I say that is because in this business, um, if you are not humble, you will be humbled. So, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to do with this presentation, I... I looked at my title and, and I said, you know, this feels a little bit presumptuous, you know, because it uh, seems like I'm uh, saying that we have solved the uh, innovative contracting practices for bridge preservation. And so um, I'm actually going to retitle. I don't know if we have to vote on that. So a second uh, motion passes. So we're actually uh, going to title this The Pursuit of Innovative Contracting Practices for Bridge Preservation. And, and the reason I, I humbly submit that title uh, change is is because uh, anybody who's been involved with uh, implementing a program within a DOT, uh, maybe similar experiences in private sector, uh, it takes a lot of work. And there are so many details to cover, and you're usually working with literally hundreds of people in a variety of uh, fashions. They, every stakeholder has their own needs and interests that uh, they have to account for. Uh, so when you get into uh, messing around with the contracting system, uh, that list of stakeholders grows exponentially within a DOT. And so, uh, so, so what we do uh, with this, this program, what we've done with this program, is, is we've just said, let's come up with a, a context. Let's find a way um, where we can really, and, and our goal, I guess, is, is to put the owner and the contractor in, in the best context where they can both be successful. Right, because if if one wins and one loses, then everybody loses. In reality, because you know it's capitalism. Everybody needs to succeed to be successful. You know, and, and contractors they need to have a way they earn their profit. They need to be made whole at the end of the day. As an owner, you don't want to pay for things that, that aren't being done, uh, but you you do really want to pay uh, for for the work that needs to get done. And so so that's that was our goal here, and and really why we went into this process. Uh, so, uh, why pursue innovative contracting, you know, so as a DOT, so I, I uh, you know, I spent 14 years in the private sector in bridge design, project management, all that stuff you do when you're in the private sector, and, and uh, um, you know, I came to NDOT, I, I was kind of blinded by a light one day, and, and uh, I heard this voice that said, you, you shall go serve in uh, the public sector, and, and so I, I took the marching orders, and, and I, I joined NDOT, and in, in that moment when I first showed up, I, I was like, okay, well, I, I have something that needs to be fixed. How do I get that fixed? And my boss says, well, you know, we have, we have this capital program. And this capital program, what we do is, is we feed these projects. And, and uh, you know, and, and so, you know, whatever needs you have, just, just uh, create a, you know, a, a project for it. We'll deliberate on it uh, six months from now. Um, if it goes through deliberations, then we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, put it out for design. Um, that'll take about, you know, six months to select a designer. Uh, then uh, they'll design it. We might have about a year or two while they design it. Uh, so we usually look at, we're going to deliver it. If you program it today, five years from now, that project will be uh, getting underway. And, and, you know, so when I was looking at that kind of time gap within our, our traditional capital program, I said, that, that doesn't really, I mean, that works for if I want to build a corridor project, if I want to replace a bridge, if I want to replace a superstructure, some, a lot of the rehabilitation stuff, that's fine because I have that time frame. But if I want to play, replace an expansion joint, I don't want to let it leak for five years while I wait to, to get the work done. And so, uh, so I perceived 
this uh, great opportunity in the, in the area of preventive maintenance where, where we could, uh, you know, kind of bridge this time gap a little bit by putting everybody in the right context to be able to deliver it in, in a fair amount of time. Uh, the, the other issue that we deal with, you know, it's really humbling for me when I come to these, uh, these meetings and, and I, I hear uh, presentations from uh, Minnesota and Michigan and, and, and I'm like, wouldn't that be awesome to have that many highly skilled workers working for the DOT who are ready to, to go out and, uh, you know, fix something at a moment's notice. And, you know, a lot of states, that's not the reality, you know, and, and you know, we're, we're working towards that, but, but where we are, you know, in all honesty versus where, where some of those other states are is, is a long way off. And so, um, so we deal with a skills gap, you know, and, and as was alluded to, you know, there's, you know, Pete mentioned it, we, there's, we need better training, and, and uh, so, so, but we have to deal with the reality of today as an owner, right? What is my reality today and what do I have available to me to get the job done? And so, so we deal with the, the skills gap within, uh, within our agency. There's a lot of things that, that our internal crews are really good at. Here's a lot of things that, that they are not or never probably will be. And so, so assessing that and determining what, what is the right work to, to be focusing on with our internal resources. And so, um, so we want to try to bridge that with this uh, contracting method. The other one is uh, an equipment gap, right? It's Contractors know where to find really cool tools, you know, and, and as a state agency, sometimes procuring that stuff or renting it or whatever, maybe it's, we're not as handy at it. And, and sometimes it's not even real appropriate because if we don't have any people that uh, know how to operate it, you know, it's just a complex process depending on the complexity of the issue you're trying to resolve. So we, uh, <clears throat> what I ended up doing is, is uh, you know, I said really what I want is an on-call contractor, you know, I mean, it sounded simple <laughs> when I said it, but... Um, the reality is, you know, uh, you're always looking at, okay, we, we need to find a way to fund this, you know, with federal funds, and, and that was the reality I was dealing with, and so, so I said, okay, well, I, you know, federal uh, funds and uh, on-call contracting aren't the best match, uh, and so, so we have to find a way that we can create the context in a way that makes everybody happy. I'm, I'm a people pleaser, I'll admit that, and so, you know, I just want to find a way, how do I make all the stakeholders happy, and so the way that we could do that is we could... Uh, I was exposed to the IDIQ program. It actually uh, came, I think Drew Story used to be with us. He, uh, he, he had been hanging out with Pete Wycamp for a while and heard about the job order contracting they were doing in New York. And so, um, so, so Drew and I, we started looking into this and saying, okay, well, you know, maybe we want to do job order contracting in Indiana. I talked to Jennifer Hawkins there in uh, New York and looked around and, you know, and of course the feds showed me the way to, uh, the way to federal funding, you know, in this, this context and it's through the SEP 14 program. And so, uh, so I started looking at SEP-14s that are active, and Missouri had uh, a, a pretty mature um, uh, one, and, and ours might read very similarly to theirs. Um, I'm not sure how that happened, but it's possible. Um, and, uh, and we had uh, Minnesota has an IDIQ program that they do, and it uh, sounds like you do a lot of the work around the uh, metropolitan area here. And so, you know, I kind of look at it as why reinvent something that's already been, been invented, you know? And so I looked at what everybody else was doing, and and, uh, and then try to figure out how we could adopt something similar within our state. So the IDIQ concept, um, you know, so the benefits of it, uh, it expedites construction procurement. You know, so we have an entire team of people uh, on, our, on our, one of our floors that uh, they work to put contracts together. So we give them our plans and our documents, and then they, you know, they take three months of, of you know, doing everything. That I don't even know what all they do up there, to be honest. And, trying not to learn and so um, so they get up there and they work with it and then they advertise it you know and they have this long process and you know three months later you know contractors can bid on it and so you know that's cumbersome if all I want to do is replace an expansion joint or you know add a little paint to the end of a bridge or whatever it is I want to do and so um, so I was trying to find a way okay let's 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 make the easy things easy make the simple things simple so that we can focus on the big things you know in the other context and so um, so, you know, it was really burning up our contracts, people having to go through all these little bitty preventative maintenance projects, you know, because as we ramp up our preservation program, um, it gets really cumbersome if, you know, because to do one little task uh, in the contracts, our capital program world, is about as hard to do one big contract, you know, because paperwork, that's, that's what we do in the government, we create paperwork. And so, um, so trying to get, you know, deal with some of the paperwork issues. and. And uh, so, so that was one thing that this does for us is we have one contract letting. And so that one contract letting, you know, allows the paperwork people to do their paperwork one time. And then we can deal with the actual work orders, task orders, job orders, whatever you want to call it, 
um, individually with a lot less paperwork. So I hate paperwork, you know, and I don't know if I get kicked out of the government for saying that, but I really do. You know, so one of the other things is talk about the overhead costs, you know, and soft costs is, is what, kind of how I refer to those, you know, and so that's a lot of that contract administration time that, that you get into. Um, <clears throat> but then uh, what it does is it puts us in that context where the contractor can provide, um, he can provide the uh, on-call construction services for us. Uh, and it's eligible for federal funding, which is, is nice. So in Indiana, our, uh, our uh, Indiana code, administrative code, it reads that uh, you have to award a contract to the lowest and best bid, I think is how it reads. And I'm not, not a lawyer, and I've seen a few episodes of Law and & Order, and not by choice, my wife likes it, but, um, it, you know, so we, I, I know a little bit about what that means, but I had to say, okay, how do I translate something like this, this mechanism, into a legal mechanism, right? And, and so what does everybody like in the contracting community? They like low bid because you can't mess with it. You know, it's, it's not a beauty contest. They can say, I'm going to come in, and I'm going to find a way to build it cheaper than the, the next person, you know? And so that's America, and so we find a way to, to, to figure out how to do that. And so I had to find a way to make this competitively bid, but the problem with that is, is on a traditional contract, you know everything that's involved with that. The contractor knows everything because you have a defined set of plans, you have a defined location. So even what you know, we forget to put in the plans as designers, the contractor still knows about it. Now you'll see it in the bid prices, you know, and you always know what you missed because you know, the cost of that one item is sky high, right? And so, um, so, so you know, the contractors, they mitigate the risk on each individual contract by being intimately familiar with the project site, right? And they know the gaps in the plans, they know the, the gaps and things that, you know, wouldn't end the risk items on the contract. And the problem with this is if you do anything in an on-call fashion, how do you, how do you tell them what, what you're going to do when you can't tell them what they're going to do, right? You can't, and so how do they know how much it's going to cost for me to go out and do that work? And so, um, so the way that we uh, overcome that is, is we uh, hired an a, a independent cost estimator uh, to build us a task catalog. And so we said, here's all the kinds of things that we think we want to do with this, right? And there can, we can miss a few things. We don't have to account for every single thing that we want to do, but um, for the most part, we try and be comprehensive. And we say we're going to, you know, you know, so if we're going to replace expansion joints or do some different kinds of work. Um, so that all ends up, and, and so that cost estimator comes in and they price it. They price it like a contractor would price it. Uh, the, the, the consultant that we're using, uh, they actually own the RS Means methods books, and, and so, so they, you know, they're pretty familiar with contractor uh, estimating. And, and so once you do that, then you can uh, advertise that book. And then uh, what, what we tell the contractor is, okay, you know, the, ev those prices are set. If you win this contract, you're going to pay that times a multiplier. And so we allow them to bid the multiplier, because the multiplier essentially is, the, is their profit and their overhead, right? Because it's America, we need, we need profit and we gotta pay for overhead, right? And so, um, so what we do is we set that up so that then they can competitively, competitively bid those items. Now they can look at those individual costs in the catalog and say, you know what, for me and for this uh, particular geographic region, I'm not gonna be able to get it for that price that's in that catalog, so that's a risk item. So then they can bid that risk into that markup that they put on the overall catalog. And, and so there's, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of ways for them to, uh, to, to play the competitive game that they have to play, you know, and that they like to play. They're, they're competitive folks, and, and I love that about our contracting industry. And so, so, so they look through that catalog, and that's how we get the uh, lowest and best bid, um, and so we can stay true to our Indiana code um, without any kind of enabling legislation, which was important to me because, um, like I said, I'm not very qualified legally for anything, to be honest. Um, so uh, the, the next... Uh, the next thing that, that uh, I really loved about this concept was what we call the joint scope meetings. And so what that is, is I have this contractor in an on-call relationship, and I found these needs that we need to go out and address. Well, legally, now I can call that contractor up and say, hey, I found a need, we need to go out there, we need to scope the work together. And so then what you do is you can go out there, so then it becomes, um, my translation of it is, it's kind of like a design build at that point where the designer is the owner. You know, so we're working with, directly with the contractor to say, I need to replace this light bulb. Um, you know, I don't know what all you're going to need. Let me know what all you're going to need. And he says, I need a ladder. You know, he says, I need a light bulb, which is 
a lot more complicated than it used to be. Um, but it, you know, and he goes through the list, he puts that into the catalog, and he comes up with the overall price of the job order. He submits that to us as the owner, and we have the opportunity to review that and say, you know, I, I'm sorry, I really don't even like having light in that part of the house anyway, and I don't want to pay this much money for it. And so we can reject the job order and say, you know, we're just not going to do it this way. Uh, or we have the opportunity to accept it, you know, or, or we could, uh, you know, make suggestions or changes or whatever. We can evaluate um, their approach to a work zone safety and say, you know what, it's worth it to me for you to put two more attenuators out there on this project. And, you know, I'm not costing you anything. He's not out anything. In fact, he's money ahead because it's already established in the catalog how much attenuators cost you know, and the time set that, uh, that uh, they pay for those attenuators. And so, so it gives you that context to be able to work through the needs with the people who know how to build it. I don't, I'm not real handy, to be honest. And so for me to go out there and say, this is exactly how you, you're going to have to build it, and every contractor is different. You know, some people like to do it one way, some like to do it another way. And so when you're with your particular contractor, it gives you an opportunity to even tailor the solution to their preferences, their abilities, their materials, and, and so you find the appropriate use of the program. And so, so it's another benefit for us and for them, I think. So this is what the uh, N.IDIQ program looks like. It's, uh, we set it up as two contracts per district. Uh, the one contract was focused on bridge preservation items, you know, and, and we just kind of threw a whole list of things in there, and so we've done uh, a little bit of each of this. Um, and we have uh, pavement preservation contracts, I, you know, I, I'm a bridge guy, I set it up for bridges, but the pavement people tried to, tried to piggyback off all of my hard work. And so, so we let them have a contract, and, and so they run around and do whatever pavement people do. The, uh, the first letting was in February 2016, and, uh, and then uh, one thing that we worked in there was um, with a pilot program and, and getting contractor buy-in. I, I always, you know, I, I want to be able to look them in the eye and say, look, you know, this is my best shot at, at setting this up for you guys, but if this is bad, you know, I'm not going to hold you to this. And in and, and the same, same way, as an owner, if we get into this and, and I say, you know what, I kind of thought you were going to be able to do this and now I don't think you can, um, then I want to have a way out too. And so, so what we do is we put an optional renewal in the contract. So it's a one-year contract with optional renewals for multiple years. And so that gives everybody an out. And so, you know, the contractor can look at it and say, you know what, we can give it a try. In fact, our first contractor is a half million dollar contract. And, and he said, you know, um, but the way we looked at it was, you know, what's the worst that could happen? We're out half a million dollars, you know, which I kind of look at that like, man, that sounds scary. But, you know, for them, it's, it's not a big deal because of the, the size of the work that they do. And so, um, you know, so just, just putting it in that, contract, that context where, you know, everybody knows that their, their risk is mitigated through um, being able to be in or out of that contract over a defined period of time. And we uh, opted to renew with that contractor. They did fantastic work. Um, we're really, really happy with them. Um, I don't know if they like me or not, but um, they didn't tell me they didn't, which is usually a sign that they like you. So the last thing I'll focus on here um, is, is just one of the contracts. We had a whole bunch of things we did with this, and I'm not good at putting pictures into s presentations. I'm a little paranoid, or I, I don't know what my problem is. But this one was an easy one because this wasn't our fault. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> as an owner, this is, this is, these are the hardest days that you have, right? You know, when you, when you get that call. And, and so this one, my, my boss walked into my, my office and, and, and she said, hey, I'm, I'm getting reports here that there was a bridge hit. She says, I'm hearing it's really bad, you know, and which happens about every other day. You know, if somebody hits a bridge, you know, sometimes even if nobody hits the bridge, we get reports that something's really bad, right? And so um, it's just the, the nature of, of the public, right? And so, um, so, so she says, hey, and pull up the pictures and let's, let's take a look at it. And so I pull up these pictures. I probably said some words I shouldn't have said, but, um, you know, then the first thing you do is you say, shut it down, shut everything down, you know, <laughs> shut it down. Every, every road in 10 miles from this is shut it all down because, <laughs> you know, because, I mean, you just... You know, the consequences of that, obviously, are, are very sobering. And so, um, so, we, so we got into this situation, and, you know, and you don't have time to think about, you know, oh, what, you know what, what happened out there. What, you know, you, you're just looking at, okay, how do we solve this? You know, because from day one, you, uh, how do we get this fixed? You know, how do we get this reopened? And this is uh, actually the, one of the prime, primary routes into the Indy 500 track. And, and so this got hit in, uh, was it January? 
you know, and so we're, you know, like I said, our capital program, we'd, we'd like to deliver things in five years, you know, and uh, so uh, five years of no traffic to the Indy 500 might not look very good for us as an, as an owner, and so, um, so immediately you, you queue it up and you start working on it, you know, and we start uh, working with fabricators, and, and so the IDIQ program was, was something that helped us with that because, again, we already had a context, you know, where we could work with a contractor, we could work with the contractor could work with the suppliers and, and, and work through the process to make sure that we, we're still not, we're not doing force account work. We're not doing it through some of the traditional methods, you know, and so that was, a, was just a nice benefit for us. And so um, the, uh, the nice part of that story is that we did have it open uh, the beginning of May, right before all the uh, Indy 500 fest festivities were to take place. Um, you know, great collaboration with the contractor. Uh, Reith Riley was our contractor on that one. Uh, GAI consultants, uh, uh, has their uh, emergency on-call contract, and so they, uh, uh, we, we pulled them in right away to do some design work for us, and, and so everybody just kind of came together, uh, did a lot of work, got it done, and, and we were able to facilitate it in a way where we had predefined prices for everything, you know, so, um, so it made it, except for the, the pre-stressed beams, and we worked through that, you know, but uh, for the most part, we could, we could work through it in that kind of context, and so um, we're, we're pretty proud of it. So this is on-call contractor. Is this... Uh federal money in it? Yes, yes, so we're, uh, we're using uh, federal funds, our, our uh, traditional 80-20 split. We didn't ask for um, any additional than that, I don't think. Um, but don't take anything back from me if, if you did give us more than that, so. Well, have you compared uh, to have on call, say, state money, uh, was that, what, is that advantage yeah, for you, yeah. I would say? Right, yeah, so we, we've looked at it, it compares favorably. Um, I, I look at it, you know, the way I approached it, and, that, and that's what, you know, the first thing everybody wants to ask in the DOT world is, is it cheaper? And it's like, well, I say I don't care if it's cheaper or not, because instead of five years from now, I'm getting it, you know, four months from now. And, and so, um, to me, if it's the appropriate thing to be delivered in that time frame, then, then cost is kind of immaterial because the consequences of not doing it are, are far greater from a cost standpoint to us as an agency. So, good question, though. Well, thank you. Yeah, is, uh, did you guys have an inflation factor in there for the second year? Like, is that agreed to or is that bid or? Yeah, so uh, I'm trying to remember how we handled it. It's been a little while since we put that together. But uh, so the way that our, our uh, cost estimating consultant likes to handle that is I think it's the, uh, what is it, the engineering, um, yeah, yeah, construction cost inflation index. Okay. And so that way it puts it away in there so that they're not held to those for the, right. the next couple of years, yeah. yeah. And then was this approved by the feds? Was this federally reimbursable? It was, is, did, yeah. is it, Was it a SEP 14 project? It is, yes. Yeah, and so I, I know Federal Highway has been looking at ways to, you know, kind of standardize some of these, these really cool, whether CMGC or IDIQ or some of these different things, and so I'm waiting with bated breath for the uh, final solution. Yes, how, was, uh, how was traffic control costs? Because ours, you know, ours varies by the type of road. This job can only be done at midnight to 5 a.m. That job can be done during the day anytime you want. Right. How did you account for that? Right. So we, uh, what we did was we put in there, so I, I said one multiplier, but we actually had a, a series of multipliers. Um, we, in, the, in our case, we had four multipliers. I didn't need them. I only needed two. But so, so if I... W to simplify it, I'll explain the two multiplier system is that we have regular working hours and then we have premium time hours. And, and so we allow the contractor to competitively bid that because I have no concept of what they were, and I don't want to learn uh, what they want to pay for overtime. So uh, The Gordian Group has a program called Job Order Contracting where they come, they're a consultant that sets up your book uh, can, and they have a price that their business uh, model is a little different than paying a consultant up front. Can, have you compared the prices of the two? And then are you bringing your consultant back to update books or add other items? Um, yeah, so, uh, so, so Gordian Group is our, is our consultant working on it. And, and yeah, so their, their pricing structure is different. Um, so, so with the, the PE side of it is how we're referring to it. Um, it. It's not federally reimbursable under their current pricing mechanism. And I know uh, New York State has always just said we're going to use state for at least if, from what I'm familiar of, it said we're always going to use state funds for to pay our consultant, you know, because that's our consultant. They're helping us facilitate this program. And, and so um, I don't know if you look at it as a strength or a limitation of, of the concept, but, but uh, you know, we're, we're looking at everything going forward of do we want to continue with, with that 
pricing structure, it's a, you know, kind of looking at it as, as one way to price it, or do we want to just go more of a lump sum manner, you know, with the consultant? Or, so, so we're constantly evaluating that and constantly evaluating, you know, is this the right consultant for us? Or, but uh, ultimately, I, I said I need a consultant because I need somebody to facilitate this because I'm one person, I have a limited amount of time, and all our contracts people seem to be busy with contract stuff that I don't understand. So, um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, or if I dodged it appropriately, or how that, yeah. The preceding video was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found at tsp2.org. That's tsp2.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.